good to be back. About this time last week, I said something's missing, something's not right. <laughs> we're not, we're not here at Landmark, and uh, boy, we sure did miss you. You know, um, we went up to to see our daughter, our oldest daughter, up in the uh, D.C. area, and. <clears throat> We've been praying for her husband for, oh, two, three years. And uh, he's a very smart guy, very well educated, had a lot of questions, and just would not focus in on things. And uh, so he found some things online, and he got interested in what's going on over in the Middle East and how are the archaeologists and so forth are working over there and the things that they're discovering is just truly amazing and so that caught his attention and the next thing you know he started uh, reading his Bible <laughs> and uh, the next thing you know the Holy Spirit started working on you think prayer works how many think prayer works anybody here you think prayer works well we've been praying and praying and praying and uh, so we visited them and we ended up in our motor home. He hadn't seen our motor home, so he came out to see it. And I just asked him straight out, how are you doing? What's, what's going on in your life? And uh, I asked him, I said, uh, would you want to give your life to Christ? He said, uh, well, I've already done that. <laughs> I've already done that. And it was so exciting. And, and he said this, I'm, I'm running across so many things. The Bible is true. It's, it's just amazing, the testimony he had. And then he said, I, I'm wondering why this isn't out there, why, why people don't know about it, you know. It, well, I said, maybe the Lord has a job for you to do, to go out there and tell people. So it was a very fruitful trip. Uh, we had good fellowship. I called him just uh, a couple of days ago to follow up on him and just... Uh, I said, I'm going to do that every week. I'm going to follow up on you every week so that, uh, uh, you know, we can have fellowship together. God is so good, isn't he? He's just so good. He's been good to all of us. I look into your faces and I miss you. You know, every one of you is so important. And uh, thank you for being out this morning. I have a question for you. Uh, who are you in Christ? What, what is it to be, to be in Christ? What does that mean? And, and how does that affect us? And what does that bring to us that we don't have when we're not in Christ? Why are we different? Or are we different? You know, um, some of you remember the, the great actor Kurt. Douglas. Remember how he used to talk, Kurt Douglas? He was in Spartacus in Seven Days in May and some other great, great films. And he was driving along one day out in California and he saw this sailor. And the sailor was trying to hitch a ride with somebody. So Kurt Douglas pulled over and gave him a ride. And the guy got in the car and he's looking around and he sees there's something about this guy here. Wait, this is just an ordinary fellow. And he said, he said, uh, hey, man, hey, do you know who you are? And, and of course, he kind of laughed. He said, yeah, I know who I am. Do you know who I am? Of course, everybody knows. I can't imagine being picked up by Kirk Douglas. Wouldn't that be something? I mean, really. The question is this. Do we know who we are? You're not just ordinary people. There's not an ordinary person sitting here. Not one. You're extraordinary. Our message this morning is from Psalms 139, 13 through 16. Psalm 139, 13 through 16. And there it talks about how each one of us individually was put together by God in our mother's womb. Now, I would have changed some things with me. You know, I wouldn't have had red hair. I mean, who wants red hair? I, uh, I would have been like, like Big Dean. Yeah. Hey, hey, hi, Pastor. I love the voice. Isn't that cool? 
I mean, it goes, it goes with him, right? If he were to walk up and he'd say, Hi, Pastor, how you doing this morning? I mean, there's something wrong there, right? <laughs> there's something wrong. But the whole package is there. Hey, Pastor. And uh, that's what I wanted to be, strong. And, uh, and I wouldn't have picked my name either. I have been over that. You got some cool names. I like the name Sid. Don't you? I mean, Sid. That's straightforward, it's manly, and, and, and he's got the voice to go with it. <laughs> Sid, that's so cool. God put you together, piece by piece. You're unique, there's no other you. You are it. <laughs> and when he put that together, that whole package together, it was for you to be used of him. In other words, you have things that you can do for him that I cannot do. You, you have talents and abilities that are unique to you. And that's what makes us so neat, is that we're different, and yet we're all together in one thing, and that's in our love for Jesus Christ. And when we come together in our love for Jesus Christ, that makes all of us stronger. It makes all of us more potent. And you take individuals that come to Christ here and there, and then you unite them together, and that's power. God has put us together to do something for him. So do we know who we are? In April 1996, an auction house uh, auctioned off the estate of the former first lady, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. Remember Jackie? You, you, all the ladies were buying Jackie sunglasses. They, they all looked, wanted the Jackie look, you know, the, the hair and the hat and the whole thing, you know. She set the trend back in her day. And they thought, well, some of these things are going to be worth some money and some aren't. Like the, the, the fake pearls that she wore, that John Kennedy Jr., the famous picture, remember when he was pulling on them and so forth, and it was so sweet. They said, well, maybe they'll go for five, $600. They went for $211,500 for fake pearls. Why? Because they were owned by somebody that had an image. They were owned by someone that, that had influence. So people wanted to buy that. I remember when uh, Jack Kennedy's golf clubs, their old, worn-out golf clubs, they sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Why? Because they belonged to a person. What value do we have? What influence do we have? You know, in God's economy, you've got a lot of value. You know how I know that? Because he died for you personally. Now, what are we going to do with that? Just say, oh, that's nice. God sent his only God begotten Son, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God came into this world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. What? The whole world? Anybody can get saved. It, it, it's the same process for each individual. We all came to the Lord the same way. I heard for the first time, probably it's been out there quite a while, but I heard for the first time the song, um, God can use a broken man. You know why? We're all broken. We're broken and spilled out before him. Our lives were a mess before we met him. And what happened? Through him and through his vicarious death for us, we became someone different. We've become a new creation, a new creature in Christ Jesus. So welcome. <laughs> that brings us together and we're together in his name. Someone wrote, once wrote, this auction is merely a vehicle to get a piece of magic, a piece of a dream. This is about a woman who was once the most admired woman in the world. Isn't that something? And uh, you know what? She doesn't hold a candle to any of you. Not one. <laughs>
I trust she was saved. I hope they were all saved, but you know, odds are they weren't. How would you get saved when you're, when you're, when, when you're an icon like that? It's, uh, uh, Jesus said it's hard for a rich man to get saved, basically, right? Easier for a camel to go, go through the eye of a needle. I mean, that's just an impossibility. So when you're surrounded with riches and people adoring you and imitating you and so forth, it's kind of hard to humble yourself, right? And humble yourself especially before God. We know these things. I would suggest these things to you. We know that we are one, a child of God, Romans 8, 16. Redeemed from the head of the enemy, Psalm 107, verse 2. Forgiven, Colossians 1, 13 and 14. Saved by faith, Ephesians 2, 8. Justified in Romans 5, 1. Sanctified in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. A new creature, creation in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Partaker of his divine nature in 2 Peter 1, 4. Redeemed from the curse of the law, Galatians 3, 13. Delivered from the powers of darkness, Colossians 1, 13. Led by the Spirit of God, Romans 8, 14. Free from all bondage, John 8, 36. Kept in safety, Psalms 91, 11. Getting all my needs met in Philippians 4.19. Casting all my cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you, First John, uh, or First Peter 5.7. Strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, Ephesians 6.10. Doing all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. An heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus, Romans 8. Uh, 17, blessed in coming in and blessed going out, <laughs> Deuteronomy 28, 6. That's you, personally. I didn't know all that. You know, you're just not an ordinary gal. You're just not an ordinary man. When you come to Christ, these are all the things that are given to you freely. You can't earn them. You can't buy them. No influence you have would make any difference. Observing and doing the Lord's commandments, Deuteronomy 28, 12. Uh, above only and not beneath. I love that, don't you? Deuteronomy 28, 13. An heir, what? To eternal life, 1 John 5, 11 and 12. Blessed with all spiritual blessings, Ephesians 1, 3. More than a conqueror, Romans 8, 37. More than a conqueror through Jesus. That means everything in our daily life. God is going to somehow give us the victory. <laughs> Establishing God's word here on earth, Matthew 16, 19, an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of my testimony, Revelation 12, 11. Uh, Psalms uh, 139, 13 through 16, and I like the message version of this. Oh, yes, you shape me first inside and then out. You form me in my mother's womb. I thank you, high God. You're breathtaking. A body and soul, I am marvelously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation! You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made bit by bit. How I was sculptured from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watch me grow from the conception to birth. All stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life were prepared before I've ever lived one day. That is you. Isn't that something? And God shaped you. He loved you even before you were born. You think your parents loved you? You think your mother loved you? Brother, that's nothing to God's love for you. Now, if our life is just so brief, and he goes through oh, this whole process of knitting us together part by part, bone by bone, and giving us a personality and a, our eye color and all that kind of stuff, he built that, and then you were given birth, and then you go out into this world, and this world says, oh, you're not much. Oh, are they missing out? <laughs> There's nothing, you know, uh, getting back to our son-in-law, there's nothing like the look on his face, the glow on his face, the smile that he had. 
when he gave his life to Christ, that just changed him radically. He wasn't even aware of it until I mentioned it to him. I don't know that I saw him smile much at all. But boy, now, and he's got a whole new purpose in life. He's, he's, he's just regenerated a whole new individual. But God had that for him before he was even born. How do I know that? Because he's sovereign. That's how I know <laughs> And I, it's just wonderful to think. Now, God went through all of this. And this nation is aborting babies just as we speak. Think of that. Think of that. You know, that to me is just, it's unfathomable how wicked that is. And yet, that's going on. Pray for our nation. Oh, man, how we need it. He knows everything about us. All the things in the shadows, all the things that we suppress, all the things we want to forget, God knows. And just think of that. The one who knows us best loves us most. He has every reason not to love me. He has every reason not to love you. And yet, what did he do? <laughs> He loves you so much with an eternal, unconditional love. And brother, that, that never stops. He loved you before you were born. He saw the, you being knitted together. And you're extraordinarily important to him. Not much uh, known about us in the world. We're just another face, just another person passing through. But you know what? To God. He watches you day and night. He's like a mother with a newborn. We have a couple of them here today, and man, they're a lot of fun. I forgot how babies could be so much fun. They grow up, and they and, and, and right away, you know, you turn around, and here they are, and they're going to school, and then they're going to high school. And next thing you know, they're out on their own, and you say, what happened? But then another one comes along, and uh, another one, and so forth. But you know what? That's what God has for us, is his protection, his love covering us. And he takes care of a baby like me. <laughs> and he takes care of a baby like you. <laughs> and that's the way he, he takes us in his arm. Hey, you think you've been hurt? Oh, go to God. You know what? He'll take you up in his arm. And when, have you ever, when you've been praying, have you ever had the experience of just God loving on you? There are times in my prayer time that, that I, I just feel his presence and I just say, wow. I mean, wow. Just stop and enjoy his presence. Isn't that cool? When he says, Barry, just, 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 just be quiet for a few. That's hard for a preacher, you know. Barry, just be quiet for a little bit. And let me love on you. Let me put my arms around you. And let me talk to you a little bit. And encourage you. And just strengthen you with my presence. Those moments are so special, aren't they? That's how important you are to him. Well, there's always circumstances that come up. Oh, in, indeed, this is life, and no one said it would be easy. David wrote uh, Psalm 139 with excitement. It, just, just think of the thoughts there. Wow, Lord, you did all that? You mended me together? Lord, you watched over me in my mother's womb? Lord, you're watching over me now. I'm wonderfully and fearfully the King James says, fearfully and wonderfully made. I wasn't an accident. You knit me together. That's exciting. Uh, he knew God and he knew God knew him. And there's an intimacy in that relationship. You know where a lot of things the people get excited about. I wasn't excited yesterday when I was watching the Michigan ball game. What happened? 
I, 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 we were headed for another championship, right? Uh, I don't think so. I, I don't think we're anywhere near that this year for sure. But people get excited. Today they'll be down there. They're already forming up down there for the Lions game. The Lions, get, in, uh, get ready for the Super Bowl, boys. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Now, I have faith, but not that much faith. <laughs> I mean, there's a limit, right? But they get excited for that. They're excited about the Tigers, you know. They have an outside chance, one in a hundred maybe, of making it to, to the playoffs or whatever. And they get excited. They fill up that stadium. And they're hollering and shouting. Hey, if anybody ought to be excited, it's us here today. I remember the first time I got excited at, at Calvary Baptist Church of Hazel Park, Michigan. Jim, you might remember this, but uh, uh, the choir got singing, that great choir we have got singing, and, and Chuck gave us his uh, concert cutoff. I used to call him, hey, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Ah. And he turned around and he walked up to the and now with his message for today. Here's David D. Allen, Dr. David D. Allen, our pastor, pastor, pastor. You know, he did that every Sunday morning for years, right? <laughs> and, uh, but one Sunday morning, some redhead in the back of that auditorium gave an amen. It's like someone let a skunk loose in the place, you know? What was that? Uh, Chuck Oman didn't know how to handle it. He kind of stumbled up to it. What was that? Haven't heard that in a long time. Well, you're going to hear it a lot more, brother. Amen. I mean, this is the time that we're going to do some expression, please. In that 2,000 seat auditorium, you hear a pin drop. Not anymore. And I got to tell you, we lived in Lake Orion, and that 35 minute drive home was one of the toughest I ever had because I got an earful. What are you doing? You can't do that. Oh, I can. And I did. That was exciting stuff. To hear the gospel proclaimed, to hear the books of the Bible explained in infinite detail the way they were, to hear someone that memorized hundreds and hundreds of verses of Scripture and had them all right up here and just rolled them out. Now that's extraordinary. What a gift, what a talent. And then to hear that great choir and all the musicians that we had. Brother, you don't like that? How can you say you're a child of God? You know, you're not going to like heaven much because that's what they're doing up there already. They're rehearsing. They're getting ready. They got great choirs over here from all nations and all languages and all cultures, and they're rehearsing for us to get there. And when we get there, we'll join in with them. Just think of the mass choir praising God along with the angels 24 hours a day, seven days a week. What's heaven going to be like? Uh, I don't know. We're sitting around playing a harp and eating grapes or something throughout eternity. You know, man, it's just going to be so boring. Oh, I don't think so, boy. Just what little bit we know is enough to get me really up and going strong. Man, I can't wait to hear all those voices blended in. And praising God 24 hours a day, seven days. We'll be going to church 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But it won't be boring. <laughs> it's going to be great. Well, if you're a Christian, the correct response to that question is, I am Christ. That's all I need to know. I am Christ. There's a time where we clash where he brought us together and we turned a corner and bam, he was there. And we expressed our love for him. And we gave our life to him. Wow. You remember that day? I remember that day. I'll never forget it. I don't know the exact day, but I know the year. I know the month. That's good enough. You know, he has a record of it right here. Oh, Barry, you, you want, come on, take a look here, because your name is written down in my book of life, and here's all the details right here. He recorded that, right? And he did for you, too. Wonderful to know him. No buts about it. 
Psalm 42, 5 says, Why are you down in the dumpster soul? Ever have a day like that? Yeah, I, I get days like that occasionally. And I got a wife that bucks me up real quick. What's wrong with you? You're married to me. That's good enough. You ought to be really dancing on the clouds. <laughs> I mean, 62 years with me is so wonderful. Okay. <laughs> you don't cry the blues around her. She's got something for you to do. We've got to clean out the garage. We've got to whatever, you know. There's always something to do around our place. <laughs> oh, am I going to pay for this? Uh, <laughs> fix your eyes on God. Soon I'll be praising again. What? Sometimes we look at ourselves and we say, oh, boy, I, I just failed so miserably, I just screwed up so miserably. Why isn't this room packed out like other guys' churches? Big audiences, big things going on, and all that kind of stuff. What's wrong with me, Lord? What's wrong? Uh, he says, what, what's wrong with you? you know, uh, he says, fix my eyes on God so I'll be praising again. <laughs> you know, uh, I listen to K Love like a lot of you do in other Christian radio stations, and oh, there's such good stuff on there, isn't there? Who am I not to worship you? You hear that song lately? Whoa! I heard that song the first time uh, we were talking to our friends at Renewal, and uh, a coach, uh, a chief there, had it on, and uh, I said, Wow, wait a minute. I nearly pulled over. Wow! You've done this, and you've done that, and, you, and you're the son of God, and you brought this whole creation into being just by speaking it out, and who am I not to worship you? Oh, ho, ho. does that ever change your perspective, huh? He puts a smile on my face. He's my God. God was prepared an extravagant feast for his children, and if you're one of his children... That's for you. Then isn't it about time you claimed your chair? That's been reserved for you at his table and start to enjoy the feast that has been prepared for you. Isn't it about time? <laughs> yeah, it is. All of us have days like that, but you know what? When we think about him and we look to him and we praise him, wow, it has an impact on us, doesn't it? You know, there's nothing going on in our life that he doesn't know about, that he doesn't care about. If he knows about it, he cares about it. So he knows what you're going through. And he says, you know what? <laughs> Why are you down in the dumpster so long? He talks to you that way, right? What's with you? Come on, get it straight. I've got great and glorious things for you. Yeah. Well, I would, but. I would, God, but, you know, I'm hurt. And I'm, and I'm feeling down, and I said, gee, I really don't know what to do. That's the best you got? That's the best answer you have for him? You're going to tell him that? I don't think so. That doesn't work very well with him. Because of all the attributes, because of all the gifts that he's given, that whole list that I listed here, backed up with a scripture where it can be found. Oh. For me, yeah. Personally, yeah. Wow. Maybe I better think this over. <laughs> there will always be an excuse for circumstances, but, but uh, the feasting that God has for us makes it well worthwhile. Despite how their circumstances look, you imagine Israel, you, you read the Old Testament, and man, they're in trouble all the time. <laughs> all the time. God puts a judge and brings them back in line, and the judge says, hey, you're going to walk this line, and they walk that line for a while, and then that judge leaves, and they get back, and they get in trouble all over again. It's kind of like us, isn't it, you know? They get their eyes off of God, and the next thing they're invaded, and they're in trouble, and God sends another judge, and it's over and over, repeated over and over in our lives, too, right? That's kind of the way things work. Despite their circumstances, Israel worshipped God for the victory that was coming on the horizon. They hadn't seen it yet, but they knew it was on the way. Why? Because a prophet told them so. Right to the very detail. He does with us, too. 
And do we believe it or not? That's the thing. Second Chronicles 20, 21 and 22. Jehoshaphat and all Judah and in the heavens of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. They were surrounded with the world's biggest, meanest army. What did they do? They went to the temple. <laughs> and, and, and their king led them in worship. He put on sackcloth and ashes, and their king led all for a, a president like that, all for a leader like that, a governor like that. Oh, man, how desperately we need that. Real, true warriors, real, true believers that will set the example. I love in the State of the Union, if a president would get up there and say, and get on his hands and knees and face before God and pray, instead of being some big old windbag of nothingness. That's what America needs. Men who are willing to stand up and use their position and authority and say, no. I'm following God. And I'm setting an example. Boy, I think, I think this nation is hungry for that. The more radical, the better. Okay. Second Chronicles uh, 20, 21 and 22, 21 says, And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness. <laughs> As they went out before the army and were singing, Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Can you imagine a bunch of singers? Now, wait a minute. Here we're it surrounded. Give me warriors. Give me stout-hearted men. They're going to spit in the face of these people. Yeah. No, uh, singers, would you line up? Who, me? Oh, meek little me. You want me to line up? Yeah. In front of the army? Yeah. Well, what do you want me to do? Well, you're going to sing praises to the Lord. What? We're in a war. Are you kidding? They're going to just uh, jump all over us, and I'm going to hit them with my clarinet and my trumpet or something. I, I don't, what am I going to do to defend? No, he says, you go out before the army, and you sing praises to God. Amen. And what does that mean? We're depending totally on God to deliver us. Because there's not one of you with a piccolo that's going to deliver anybody. Right? That is faith. Brother, that's taking God at his word. Even when all the odds are against you. And now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and what? They were defeated! God does a good job, <laughs> I tell you. When you go after him, you're going to be defeated. <laughs> no doubt about it. And they began to praise and sing right there, and God moved into action, and you went down. If you're down in the dump, start singing. If you're on a mountain, keep singing. Wherever you are, keep on praising God all the way for what he is not only done for you, but is going to do for you. He's not through with you. When I wake up in the morning, I say, boy, praise the Lord, I guess you got something for me to do today, huh? Because you left me here. One of these days, I'm going to praise the Lord over there. But right now, he wants me praising him where? Here. <laughs> oh, my. God's principles are not limited to their surroundings or circumstances, and neither are yours. His principles work, no matter where we are. And finishing with this, Isaiah 43, 16 through 19 in the message version. This is what God says. The God who builds a road right through the ocean, who carves a path through the pounding waves, the God who summons horses and chariots and armies, they lie down and they can't get up. They're snuffed out as many candles. Forget about what's happened. Don't keep on going over history. Be alert. Be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? We've been up against a wall with this church. This is our third place. Can you imagine meeting in our home? 
cramming all you guys in our home. We did that for six or seven weeks, as I recall. You know, what God says, you do it. I've got something for you. And here we are. Amen. You like that? Amen. I kind of think that's pretty good. Ephesians 3.20 says, For God can do what? Exceedingly, abundantly. Right? That's pretty big, right? More than we can what? Huh? More than we can ask. I ask some pretty big things, you know, or think. How does he do that? According to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I can have some big things. And God says, that's big? You're at, that's a big deal for you? <laughs> Let me tell you something, brother. I spoke the universe. <laughs> you think I can't handle that? You think he can't handle the things in your life? Come on. He sure can. <laughs> Your relationship with his son Jesus has reserved your place at his table and every promise in the Bible is yours to lay hold of. What? There's thousands of them. Think of that. You can lay hold of all of them if you have the faith. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 let your conduct be without covetousness. Oh boy, covetousness? Now today, materialism? It's incredible. Be content with such things as what you have. For what? For he himself has said what? I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will, cannot, I will not bear what? What can man do unto me? I love that, don't you? What can man do unto me? He can hurt me, but God can revive me. He can kill me, and I'm in God's presence. Why do I fear man? You know, there's names like uh, Stalin and Khrushchev. I remember when Khrushchev took his shoe off at the United Nations and, and pounded it on. We will bury capitalism. Well, guess who's dead and buried? Yeah, Stalin too. All of those reprobates and they're ju being judged before God. What can man do unto me? He can shun me. He can. I had that happen when I was at General Motors when we had a Bible study there. People go, <laughs> uh, I don't think they're doing that now. You know? Small, only 40 people or so. But you know what? That went on for years after I was transferred out to Denver. I, you know, there are things eternal that God allows us to partake in. Not things just for today. We don't know the influence. I didn't know the influence that I had with people. Had no idea. But God uses you that way. Every one of you. With all the people you wait on, there's something different about you. And Sid, with all the people you work with, hardened guys in the plant, tough guys and so forth, they know your testimony. And Jim, with you, all they have to do is look at the floor in your buildings and they know your testimony. That's powerful stuff, friends. And the parking lot full at your place. We went by yesterday. You couldn't get another car there. Isn't that great? What a testimony for God. Live for him, folks, please. Time is short. And I invite you to take advantage of all the things that God has for you. Let's pray. Father, we, we just love these type of messages that shows us who you are that shows us the love that you have for each one of us, no matter what we've been, no matter where we've been, no matter what we've said, it, it doesn't matter. We give our life to Jesus Christ. Our past is totally washed away in his precious blood. And we become a new creation, a new creature in you, Lord Jesus. We don't even have to worry about all that stuff that we've been dragging around for all these years. If there's anybody here that's never given their life to Jesus, and they're dragging around that sandbags 
of their past and the sins that the Satan keeps reminding them of. May they just give that over to him right now. Give it over to the Lord right now. How do I do that, Pastor? Silently from your heart to God's heart. You can pray this prayer. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying on that cross for me personally. Thank you for shedding your life's blood to wash away my personal sin. I give my life over to you just now. Come and sit on my heart. Take over my life. Wash my sins away in your precious blood. Make me a new creation, a new creature in you. And I will serve you from this moment forward. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for paying the price and the penalty for all I've done. It's all gone now. And I will serve you. And, and, and Father, if anybody's prayed that prayer, in this great auditorium or in our extended congregation around the world on the Internet, you heard that prayer. Their sins have been washed away. They've been born again into the family of God the Father. Thank you, Father, for what you've done to someone today. And Father, as we close this service, may none of us be in the dumps about anything. May we go out of this place different from when we came in. <laughs> and we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.